Welcome to the podcast. Uh, I'm Mike Bordenero, and today our authentic falconer is Vinny Harris. Uh, thanks for coming on, Vinny. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. Awesome. Glad to have him. Uh, Vinny actually is a business owner. He is um, the business owner of Advent Retrievers. They are training bird dogs, specializing in that. And he's, of course, a falconer. So we're going to talk about how those two things kind of tie hand in hand with falconry. And um, maybe we can get some tips for the people that are trying to do it yourself, dog train, you know, people that are stuck in certain areas. So right hopefully on. we can get some yeah, free absolutely. information. Yeah, for you. absolutely. Love to give it. <laughs> right on. Uh, but I'd like to start with uh, your, your kind of your journey into falconry. So what uh, was that like? My journey into falconry, um, I guess, without my knowledge, it started when I was you know, early kid, 10, 12, you know. And um, when I first decided to look up and go, oh, wow those birds are flying. <laughs> well, I wonder what that's like. And it just, they kind of just captivated me. I, you know, to, today I know that it was a red tailed hawk that I saw, but when I was a kid, you know, I, was, I swear it was an eagle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, so I started at a young age, I started just looking up and I would just follow them and watch them. And, you know, I'd be at, you know, barbecues or other with friends and stuff. And I would just get lost in the sky, just looking at these birds. And I was like, I don't know how or what, or any way I can work with these things, but like, if the opportunity ever arises, like I'm going to jump on it. And, um, you know, being a, a gun hunter and being into bird dogs and stuff, you know, you pass by the falconry regulations all the time. And yeah. it's like, well, falconry starts early and goes later. And I was just like, well, what is falconry? Right. And so, you know, I dove into it, hit the Google search and started delving into it. And I was just like, oh yeah, this is it. This is it. This is what I was looking for to make that connection from sky to ground to me. And, um, and so, yeah, I jumped into it and found a sponsor, did, started studying and became obsessed. And ever since, you know, um, <laughs> it's been ruining my life for the better. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Most people, like, they have an experience with a bird or something, but you actually, you just really enjoyed it. And yeah. then you did the research and then you found it. Yeah. So that's really cool. Yeah. Definitely. I'm sure your sponsor saw how passionate you were. You know. I would like to believe so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so talking about your sponsor, um, was it hard to get one or how did that, how did that work? Um, I, it wasn't as hard as I anticipated it was as hard as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Um, I joined the group and you know, they said, introduce yourself. And I was like, okay. And then two seconds later, my, uh, what I didn't know, but now my sponsor, um, sends me a message that said, Hey, read these three books. If you want me to sponsor you. Oh, okay. I was like, uh, I was like, well, I don't know who you are, <laughs> but sure. I'll read these three books right now. <laughs> Whatever you and, wish. Yeah. And I read those three books and he signed off and, um, it's been great since. That's right. Which books were they? Um, it was, uh, it was don't shoot the don't shoot your dog. Okay. Um, un it was un unorthodox. I think it is or unorthodox hunting methods. I believe it was by Dan Brown. And then, um, what was that book by Conrad Lenz? Yeah, and another book by Conrad Lenz. Okay. I, this was years ago. <laughs> right. uh, how long ago was that? Oh. When you first got into falconry? Two years ago. Two years ago. Two years ago. So you're almost a general, right? Yeah, yeah. I've read like 10 books since then. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad that, um, you know, I want to get an aspect from everyone in their, mm -hmm. you know, falconry career. Yeah. And it's perfect. Like you've just almost finished your apprenticeship. Yeah. And it's great to shine a light on, you know, where you're at. And people are just, you know, wondering what it takes to get there. So yeah. hopefully this information will be able yeah, to Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully yeah. so. So what is uh, your first falconry bird? Was it a My first falconry bird was a red tail. It okay. was a tearsel red tailed hawk. Nice. What'd I, you name him? Um, I named him Drake the Rapper. I don't like <laughs> Drake the Rapper. <laughs> um, this was me. Yeah. Is that the whole thing? Yeah, like this Drake, Drake? Drake the Rapper, the whole thing. The Not whole Drake thing. is Drake okay. the Rapper. Um, That's quite a title. <laughs> never listened to any of Drake's music. Are you uh, serious? Yeah, I don't know. I think a friend came by and was just like, hey, that looks like a Drake. I was like, like the rapper or like a dragon? He's like, the rapper. I was okay. like, all right, we'll do it. <laughs> um, and he turned out to be an all right bird, small okay. bird. <laughs> nice. Yeah. What did you... Uh, you hunt with them um pigeons i pigeons. stayed on pigeons um i know the the common thing you're supposed to do as a as an apprentice is you get a red tail and then you go on cottontails and you go on jackrabbits and that's what you're supposed to do and um me i you know i couldn't get this i couldn't get this bird you know a young apprentice i can't get this bird to go after rabbits like i just yeah. i just couldn't do it and um and so my sponsor suggested like do you have pigeon slips i said well i got a billion pigeon slips he's like well 
try pigeons. <laughs> It's uh-huh. like, okay. <laughs> and I did. And the bird got him and it was catching him. It was catching him all the time. And I was like, well, all right. So I guess my falconry experience, you know, it may not be the traditional sense of, you know, go get jackrabbits, go big, go home. Yeah. Um, but I was able to work with the juvenile red tail and teach it a new skill, you know, teach it, enter it on a new prey. So when it was released back into the wild, it had a little bit better of a chance, you know, instead of being the 80% that's going to die, it yeah. could hopefully um, ride that 20% when it got back into the wild. And I felt, you know, that was the best of my abilities in my apprenticeship. And so it worked and I kind of just stuck to it. <laughs> that's awesome. So did you, um, you must have bagged them on Cottontail, right? Um, I... It was hard for me to find bags, like okay. realistically as an apprentice, you know, falconer, you know, you jump yeah. in it. There's, I mean, there's two or three falconers, I think that live around me. Um, and I didn't know any of them. And the ones that I did know flew long wings. So it was like, okay. you know, do I drive seven hours to <laughs> go pick up a cottontail, you, you know, go down there. And, um, you know, I was just thinking of like, you know, what's realistic, what's financially realistic in my life. And like, um, how do I want to do this and what's going to be the best for the bird? You know, am I yeah. trying to fight this really unnatural thing, you know, just like go after this, go after this, go after this, or can I present them with, you know, a, a new opportunity, something new and new that they can take with the rest of their life. You know, if yeah. they're in a place where they only got pigeons, then cool. They can hunt. Yeah. And eat. Well, if it was a small male and he was game for yeah. you know, pigeons, yeah. Yeah. there's absolutely what nothing what wrong with that. He wants what he wanted to do. So yeah. I'll let him do it. Him <laughs> <Yeah>. Anywhere else. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Um, and I've never had a, I've, you know, um, I didn't back him. He went after it. He oh, just, okay. yeah, he just went straight just after went pigeon. Straight yeah. Which blew my mind. <laughs> I was like, nice. okay. I was like, no one talks about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> true. like pigeons. <laughs> um, so what did you, um, what did you learn from your sponsor in the last c- couple of years that you would like one thing that stuck that you would want to pass on? Um, one thing I stuck, um, for my sponsors out of so many things was that, um, he really hit home, you know, don't get comfortable in your own ways. Don't get so set in stone that nobody can tell you anything. You know, be teachable, you know, learn from the kings, learn from the peasants, learn from absolutely everybody. And, um, you know, take everything with a grain of salt, process it, apply it to your life. If it works, great. If it doesn't, you know, move on and just, um, you know, just stay open. He was, he had a plethora of resources for me, um, but he was always very open to, you know, Make sure, you know, if I say something, you know, look it up, you know, do some more research and put bits in together. And um, he gave me the freedom to really just, you know, how decide how falconry was going to fit in my life. Because yeah. it kind of fits in everyone's life a little bit different. It definitely yeah. does. Yeah. So uh, was there, uh, he, I know you, t- you told me he had the three books you had to read. Mm-hmm. Were there any other parameters that um, he set as you got further, like he would tell you to do something? Um, he particular I, I'm gonna say no um, because his approach was more so um, you know my sponsor entered my life and you know and he he knows he knows a lot about me you know I was very open with him um, so with the information that he knows on me he was able to you know construct a teaching method that would suit me versus you know just a this is what everyone gets good luck and if it doesn't fit you good you know you're out of luck yeah. um, and so yeah he he really he got to know me and he basically created like this teaching program based on like how I would respond to it. And so and the way I would respond to it is, you know, if he said, you know, today you're, you know, we're for the, the goal is to free fly your bird, you know, we get there, we free fly a bird. He's like, okay, now this is the next step. And this is the next step instead of, you know, this is the whole thing. And if you're not oh. there, well, go find another, you know, yeah. go find another sponsor. And so he really walked me through it and um, kind of like, you know, he let me abandon all the pre like ideas of what an apprentice is supposed to be, how much game they're supposed to be getting, you know, how, you know, how successful they're, they're sure, supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. And so competition of it. Yeah. Yeah. That, absolutely. Aside from the actual progress of yeah. your bird. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, did you have any challenges with your, um, red tail yes. after? Oh, okay. Let's yes. Still and I would them. love to tell everybody <laughs> this. Listen, okay. awesome. um, Aspergillosis is a big issue up here in the valley. It is. We have farmland everywhere. Um, I have red tails that I've known, master falconers, all up and down, you know, California. They were running with asper problems last year. Um, The method that works so far 100% is to get your bird on pines. You know, if your bird's going to be in the box, cut up pines and stick it in there. Um, It can never be on too many pines for too long. 
So yeah. to always just so put that's it on preventative. Preventative. And birth. also it will work as um, a treatment. Yeah. Um, so I've had births who are diagnosed with Asper and tried the Asperzole and all that stuff. And I found that it just, you know, it taxes the immune system a little bit more than I would want. Um, yeah. And it already stressed bird. And so those pines, uh, they work, you know, that's what they build their nests out of for a reason. And they work. And so if you're a young apprentice and, and you're worried about Asper, stick some pines in your hawk box and you'll that's, be all right. Yeah, all that's right. a great preventative yeah. thing for sure. And when they do get Asper, even if they heal, it's always they're always scarred from it, yeah, so they're yeah. you know, a little bit less healthy. Yeah. So, but that is great. Uh, I want to talk about Advent Retrievers. Sure, let's talk about so them. <laughs> you got your own business yes. now, and um, what is it that uh, what is it that you do? You do hunting dogs and falconry dogs. Um, so I like to just say I do bird dogs now because bird at first dogs. I used to say hunting dogs, and then okay. you were like, "Well, do you train falconry dogs?" I was like. Yes, I train bird dogs. <laughs> sure, well, that that works. Okay. Bird hunting, bird dogs. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, so I'm mainly retrievers. Um, you know, your Labradors, Goldens, and your Chesapeake Bays, and all those guys. Um, and a little bit of upland work, um, but mainly retrievers that are you know people are going to hunt with or run hunt tests or field trials okay. with, and um, also sell. There's <laughs> already trained dogs. Got you. Um, so when you're selecting or when you're recommending dogs, um, you just said you you work with retrievers. Is that exclusive or are you going to work with someone like who's hunting a certain game who might want to go for just jackrabbits or someone who might want to just go for quail or a specific dog for the specific okay, task? Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, um, see, with even me jumping into falconry, it kind of gave me a different outlook because, you know, gun hunters, we look at things a certain way and that's it. And, you know, falconers, they look at things this way and that's it. And so being a falconer and then jumping into it, it kind of gave me, it kind of opened up my perspective on, you know, hunting dogs and training them. And so, as you said, now, you know, if somebody brings me, they say, hey, you know, I want to hunt jackrabbits here in California. Um, what kind of dog do I need? You know, I can, you know, we can talk about it and go through it and see what they need. Or, you know, you need some sort of whippet or whatever, some sort of whatever slips you have. And I'm um, just being knowledgeable to about that, um, you know, urban hawking, if you will. And um, so, yeah, so it kind of just opened me up to all of it because, you know, you'll have people who are like, well, I want to hunt quail. Or, you know, Falcons yeah. are like, I just want to hunt cocktails. And you're like, all right, well, this is a specific dog that will work um, better for that versus like a lab that will cover all your bases and like, a family that hunts ducks all the time with a gun. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I was, that was, I was going to say, so labs are great to go in the water, yeah. to, you know, put some ducks up in the air. What, what else, um, would a retriever be perfect for in the Falcons um, you, scenario? If, if it's not black, <laughs> um, you can get away with um, a lot of good <laughs> upland hunting. I only say that cause the sun burns them out quick if they're black. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. So they say, um, That's funny, you yeah. can, you can, um, labs make good upland dogs. They make, um, good flushers. Um, they make, they make good search and rescue dogs. Um, they make good rabbit dogs. I did cotton tails with, um, with my lab and who also doubles as my uh, duck dog. Okay. Um, so anything that's going to be, there's going to be a good chase. If they're, if the labs love chasing something. So if you know your rabbits and all that stuff, if they can chase it, lab's great for it. Okay. Um, but if you're going to be in a place where, um, oh, you know, sorry about oh, that. no worries. Um, you're not going to have be around a lot of water or marsh or something, you know, you might look at different options where, you know, you don't want the, the coat of a lab that's going to burn up in the sun. If that yeah. makes sense. That does. I've heard that the, um, it's funny you mentioned the black labs. I heard the black labs aren't the smartest of the colors. <sighs> that true it's a terrible thing to say <laughs> <laughs> maybe they are the smartest no 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 um i'll say this labs don't know what color they are okay. um and the i guess the the wife's tale of this color is worse than this color worse than the, of whatever is uh -huh. you know if i came over your house mike and you had a yellow lab that was just outside out of control I just out of control and I knew nothing about dogs and I ran into your yellow lab and I went oh yellow labs are terrible because my buddy has a chocolate lab and it's a girl and it's old and you don't you know you don't know the background of the dog and you're like you see the dog and you go oh it's chocolate so it must be that's why it's this chill and that's why it's so trainable because it's okay. chocolate versus you know we don't look at the hundreds of years of breeding before and all the things or even the factoring just the upbringing of the puppy yeah. and so um yeah there's there's no difference I, I wanted to correct my statement i think it was chocolate that was the <laughs> dumbest from what I've i will heard. agree <laughs> <laughs> you agree with that i will agree okay but i think it has to do with their breeding <laughs> generations it will it's because um you know the chocolate was introduced later on as kind of a, a i don't want to say designer color but you know as oh look they're chocolate now yeah. and so they bred for the specific color and they're like okay people want to hunt them so they're like, now we have to breed them for performance versus you know 
the first few laps are yellow and black <laughs> that yeah. existed, you know? And so it's okay. like, you know, they have a lot of catching up to Not to say there's not good chocolates out there. I've trained a lot and some of my favorite dogs are chocolate labs, but okay. you know, they genetic wise, they, <laughs> well, I'm they glad have, you cleared yeah. that up. That's, there. that's yeah. what it's, that's what people <laughs> have issue with chocolates. That's why. <laughs> um, so what do you think training a, let's just say overall blanket hunting dog. What do you think the biggest mistake most people make when they try and do it themselves? Um, you know, unexperienced dog uh, trainer. Okay. Um, I would say one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen when people bring in their dogs is that they have a um, preconceived idea of what the dog should be doing. Okay. You know, they, they get a puppy, it's four months, I threw a bird for it and want nothing to do with it. I have a, you know, I have a pointer, it's six months old, I put a dead bird in front of it and it didn't want anything to do with it. This dog's ruined. You know, and that mindset alone, just like it hinders the development of a dog because, you know, it's like asking a child to, okay, well, go shoot 40 points in a basketball game. Child's gonna be like, what's a ball? <laughs> Wait, yeah. what are my hands? <laughs> you, yeah, you're you know, skipping, skipping yeah, you're skipping everything. so much. And, um, I would say that preconceived idea, if you do your homework and you get good blood, you know, you get good paperwork and it's a good, healthy dog. Um, and the drives there, it's all training after that. And so if you say something like this dog is gun shy, well, you made your dog gun shy. That's an artificial thing. Man creates that. They're not naturally like that. And so, um, yeah, so I would just say that people, they have their own idea of how it should be. And when the dog doesn't meet that expectations, they kind of just. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So are there things that people can do that to instill, like, obviously I've seen dogs that are afraid of people. They yeah. They've gotten, you know, bad experiences. Fear has been instilled into them. Um, in training, are there techniques that is borderline um, to, detrimental to their, you know, their um, just overall goal? to work with you. you okay. Know, it kind of brings them back a little bit. Okay. So things that you're like, you know, training. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, no, depending on the dog's age, it boils down to the age, you know, no hard reinforcements. That's something people, you know, if in the overtraining, you know, where your sessions are too long, um, okay. it's better them to be too short than too long. And so if you, you know, if you're working in a 10 minute frame with a young pup, and you start getting to the 20 minutes, the 25, and you're getting frustrated because the dog's not doing what you want, and you're getting frustrated, and the dog's frustrating, and it's this back and forth. Um, okay. I would say avoid all that. It's better to be put all your emotions aside the day, put it away, the stress from the day, the stress from work, put it all aside, and spend those few minutes with your puppy completely neutral, you know, completely looking at your puppy, going, this is what we're going to do for the training, you know, this is what we have to do instead of, I feel all these things. So good luck, puppy. <laughs> yeah, kind of ordeal. Okay, that makes sense. No, that does. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. So you definitely recommend shorter, good, positive short training, yep. short and, and sweet. longer. Yeah, beating a dead horse. Yes, like, where you, they just have opportunities to yeah. mess up. Yeah, and kind of ruin your your positive result of that training. Yeah, session. absolutely. And you want to cool. leave on a nice, good, positive note. <laughs> nice. Um, what would be like the average time frame? Let's say someone came to you and said, "I want this dog trained," and this is probably a broad question. It's a broad question. All stages, but let's say we have a puppy that you start fresh. Start fresh, eight week old puppy. Yeah. <sighs> eight week old puppy, you're gonna be looking at. at it's tricky because you would. I know you want a concrete number, um, but you're gonna look at probably if you do like a month of puppy training with that young pup for a couple months. You know, it's real light, basic stuff, and while you know, because you don't want to do too much with a, you know, a puppy who's not developed yet, um, but. Once they're at the age of, I, I like to call it just girth. They got girth to them, you know, around four or five months where, you know, okay. you move them and they don't, and you're like, yeah, you're not just like, pu you yeah. know, they're all puppy <laughs> soft, you know. Those are the dogs, yeah. you know, they're going to hit the water and, you know, you're like, they're going to be all right. You know, you don't have to worry about a big catfish coming up and sucking them down because <laughs> that's a thing apparently. Is it really? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, but um, so generally if your dog is already, you know, of, body, of able body ready to work about three months. Three about about okay. three months. So, and that'll get you a, a started dog, which for all intents and purposes will hunt just fine. You'll be happy hunting that dog all season long. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. That's uh, I would have thought longer. But you, can, you can get a lot done in three months. Yeah. Don't let those trainers I'm sure, tell you. Yeah. Differently. <laughs> I'm sure every dog is different, yeah. especially if you have one that hasn't been like a not, not a puppy, like an older puppy. Yeah. Or um, an older, an, an older adult. dog. <laughs> I had, um, I have a, two-year-old lab i got he was a rescue and um i mean i when i picked him up i thought he's gonna bite me he was just so like you're like there he is and there's like this fence and he was just standing on it just screaming i was like sick <laughs> <laughs> that's my dog and so i took him and you know and worked with him and trained him now he's you know he's the greatest hunting dog ever as any person would say about their dog um 
But, you know, training him, you know, it's the still same three, four months. It was like, you know, it was in that kind of three fun, really? fun more than Yeah, because okay. it's, um, and he's never, you know, never hunted anything, never been around guns, water in his entire life. Um, so you can definitely cheat, cheat an old, cheat, cheat, teach an old teach dog new tricks. Right Absolutely. Um, the, um, oh gosh, I lost my train of thought. I was going to ask you a really good one. We'll come back to <laughs> that. <all> right. <laughs> um, so training dogs and training raptors. That's got to be two different worlds. Are they related or do they have a lot of overlapping similarities or is it just? Yeah, unfortunately they do. They, they do, do overlap a lot in, in really? the in the weird ways. <laughs> For example, um, like, you know, a dog's an emotional creature. Yeah. A raptor is not an emotional creature. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. you can come home, your dog hugs you, it's a great day. You go hug, hug your raptor, you're going to go to the hospital. It's probably going to foot you in the face. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of ordeal. But they're they both possess drive and you can you know you see it in a retriever when they hit the water to hit the ice and they just break through and keep going and you're like yeah grab that goose that's still fighting yeah. and in a raptor you see it you know when they cut through those bushes and they hit the bush and the bunny runs in there and they pursue on foot and the bunny runs out and they chase after it and so you you have these levels of drive and they're different inside different birds and different dogs too and so taking taking that drive and shaping it to the behavior that we want is is the same for dogs that is birds it's just executed a little different so if i if i wanted my dog to come to me in front of me you know i could put a tr tidbit down on my hand and say here and show that i have it you know it gets closer and hand it to it um with the bird you know you can take a tidbit drop it on the ground and give a whistle and you do it enough times your bird's going to come holding for that ground and grab that tidbit and you just pick your bird up yeah <laughs> you know um just that they're one there. I would say the similarities is that they're one sided. They're just like, boom, this is what we want. We want to work. And so yeah. we work. And, okay. you know, you get, I can see that for sure. Yeah. Um, now you deal with people and I'm sure dealing with people is a little difficult, especially with animals involved. But do you have people that come in with um, expectations and then they're not met? <laughs> the end result yes <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes okay. absolutely um and again it, it comes down to that a preconceived idea you know if someone drops off their dog to me i i try to give them as much information as before they even come here you know i tell them you know this is what we're doing and they get the day they get the play-by-play -play. they know exactly what we're doing every single day okay um, the equipment we're using and you know kind of general time frame and um but you know they still can take all that and come to me and go this is what i want for my dog make it happen and you know and as being in the service industry, you know, that's your job. You're supposed to take what they give you and make it happen. But the, the, you know, the wild card is it's a dog. <laughs> it's a, yeah. it's an animal, you know, you can't, they're unpredictable at times, you know, you can't, sure, yeah. you know, it's a dog, what are you going to do? And um, so, yeah, they'll come in and, you know, do the whole training and I'll walk them through it. And where I, f I find like where people get really like, eh, about it is when they take their dog home and then they don't follow through. That is wow. very, this, it's more important than the training itself. You know, that follow through. I should tell people, if you listen to what I say, you know, you follow through with your dog, your dog will be better, you know, three weeks after it leaves than it was when it initially left here. Just yeah. because, you know, the training progresses because you're working with your dog. And um, yeah, I would say that's where it probably for, falls short for the very few people who don't understand the concept okay. of training. I do my <laughs> best to try to tell them. Yeah. <laughs> so the people that don't, use trainers and they want to do it themselves mm -hmm. and they get the books and stuff and um, people like that, they struggle still. And is there something in those books that they're missing or is there like a tip? Yes, there is. There's absolutely something there's missing. Yeah. Um, Cause I've read, a, I don't want to say I read all of them, but I've read a lot of them <laughs> because okay. you know, no one taught me how to do this. It was just like, I need to know how to do this. So I just learned how to do it. And um, the look at me command, Google it, whatever it is you need to do. The look at me command should be the number one thing you do with your puppy as soon as you bring it home. Um, the look at me command is, so you got a little pup, pick him up, put him on a play stand, um, grab some food, you know, hand it to him. So he, immediately he starts associating your hand with food and then you start putting it to your face and you say, look at me. You say, look at me, you know, look at me, Sparky, whatever your name is. Yeah. And you hand him in the eyesight, you hand him that tidbit and you know, you hand him that tidbit again. And then the next week, all his meals have came from that tidbit. So as the dog progresses and goes over and, you know, and you're running, you know, cold blinds 200 yards away and you hit that whistle, that dog looks at you with such intensity because it knows, you know, the, the, the drive behind look at me and the food drive, he's pointing it right at you. He's going, I know if I do this command, I'm going to get it. So it creates this intensity in your dog. That's just like, just tell me, just tell me what you want me to do. And I <laughs> swear I'll do it right now. <laughs> and so the look at me command, because, you know, the, the eyes are the windows into a dog's brain so wow 
look at me command for sure. Look it's at me command. Simple and mm, yeah. valuable, very valuable. That sounds like you could do that just for a house dog. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if you're not training. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I do to all my dogs. All yeah. of them know look at me command. <laughs> awesome, dude. Um, do you um, use shot collars, GPS collars? Um, I use I use e collars. I'm I'm. Uh, <laughs> I am petitioning and contesting for them to be switched to e-leashes. <laughs> e-leashes. We say e-leash. Um, just because, you know, shot callers get such a negative condemnation. When somebody hears shot caller, they're like, ugh. Like, oh, yeah. I don't want to punish my dog, you know? And um, so we use e-callers and e-leashes, if you will. And the way they work is that, you know, they're, they're there for you not to have to use them. And they causes, you know, I would say less discomfort than, you know, pulling on a choke collar or pulling on one of those you know spike leads or whatever um that people are constantly you know you tug on your dog for you know 10 years of its life with a prong collar because it's not listening versus you know you spend a couple weeks just training e-collar conditioning and in that the way it lurks is if you know we give a command and the dog already has to know the command 150 percent in all situations you already know the command with no pressure and so we give the command and then we apply pressure with the stimulation from the e-collar which is, is about as uncomfortable as a pull of a lead you know, and once they comply, the stimulation goes away. And so once they grab that concept and they, they're like, yeah, the, I got it. You know, when you say here, they come because they're trying to beat the pressure, just like a bird, just like anything else. Just like when we get home, when we're rushing to get home because we're like, we don't want to beat the pressure of getting home late. She's going to be mad, <laughs> you know, so I want to yeah. get home. And so, <clears throat> yeah, so they want to beat the pressure. And so they kind of operate in this you know, these boundaries and you see these dogs that are like really good dogs, you know, but they're like so set in their good habits that, you know, they're great dogs. They'll be great dogs forever. And right. um, that's kind of how it works. Yeah. So I had sense. a problem. I had a, I have a Brittany and whenever she would be chasing cottontails, doesn't matter if we're in a field like you know, 400 yards away from the street, if she eventually gets there and I'm having to use that collar and shock her, um, sometimes her drive is just so like strong, like it'll, she'll, I'll hear her scream and then she'll keep going. She just keeps going. Yeah, she just wants it no matter yeah. what. So what, in a situation like that, obviously I'm a bad trainer. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Not so at all. What did I do wrong? What, how would I No, you're a great trainer because you said, what did I do wrong? Yeah. You know, okay. that's, that's perfect. You know, I do the same thing. Ah, oh, I don't, what did I do wrong? You know, if it's, I got all the answers, it's not working, the dog's dumb, whatever, no, the dog's uh -huh. not dumb. Um, with that, I would say it's time to come back home. It's time to get back in the yard and do some more basic obedience, some basic training. And so- I didn't do any of that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so you're not a bad trainer, you just didn't do the training. <laughs> um, you know, get back to that. And then, you know, once you're, you got your dog coming back to you nice and good, or, you know, however, however you want to teach your dog your recall, because there's so many different ways to do it that, you know, people don't have to get hung up on just, you know, this is how I get my dog to come back to me. Like, there's, there's really not too many wrong ways to do it. And um, so once you're working with that relationship, you know, having your dog come back to you um, when you're in your yard, you know, grab that cottontail and let it run around your yard. And, you know, when your dog starts peeling, you say, here, you know, tug it with you on that leash. Just to your ear and start drawing, drawing it in, drawing it in. And once your dog's close to you, you know, let it go. And so when it'll learn that when the opportunity presents itself and you ask me to come back to you, if I come back, I get to get it. And, you know, it's a thing that we use in retriever training. You know, when the duck goes down, the dog's like, you know, they just stare at you like, because I'm waiting for you to give me that go. Because I know if I sit here, I'll get to get it. And the same with the Brittany. Um, so if you need to use it, I would say that's what she had to do. Go back, do some little more homework with the e-collar. You know, show her that when the stimulation comes and you pull her, you know, stimulation, pull her towards you. And then when she comes to you, let go. So she knows when it goes off that that's what you're asking her to do. Yeah. Because if you know, if you do something like, you know, give her stimulation, she runs, 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 she's not stopping you, let go. In her brain, she goes, well, if I just keep running and screaming, it'll just turn off. <laughs> so she just keeps running and screaming, and it turns off. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, that's okay. what I would say. Just get back in the yard a little bit, do a few more sessions with her, yeah. and um, you'll be good. Cool. It's pretty incredible how, you know, bird dogs, they're, naturally, they point. Yeah. They don't really have to do anything yeah. as, as far as that goes. Yeah, if you get a good one. <laughs> instinctual. Yeah. You know, they may not have the best nose, but when they do. When they get going, it's, it's nice. It points. Um, so do you have a dog training book to recommend? A dog training book to yeah. recommend? Oh, wow. For, this is for your everyday? Yeah, for someone who wants to, let's, let's start with just someone who wants a well-trained dog, and then if you have one for something that would correlate with falconry. All right. Well, if, you got, if you're getting yourself a puppy and you want to train your puppy, 
you're already investing in something and it's already a lifelong commitment. So I'm going to talk to you about two books. Okay. <laughs> if you already get a puppy, you could, if you're going to read a book, one book, you can read another. Um, first one, you know, Karen Pryor, don't shoot the dogs classic, get it, understand theory, understand training theory. Um, it's real simple. It's a really short read. You can pick up your library or Amazon for like eight bucks, that one, and then pick up water dog. It's a classic book that teaches you how to go through, you know, or the basic, basic to like intermediate advanced um, waterfowl retrievers. Basically that'll get you through, um, you know, your everyday guy who's just going, you know, hunting public lands or they got a little private club and they, you know, they shoot, you know, three or four times um, a week. You know, you pick up those two books, you'll be in good, 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 good hands. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. Nice. Read Don't Shoot the Dog first though. Don't shoot the dog. <laughs> okay. Um, when you're introducing a dog to a um, new falcon or a new hawk, what is, um, what is like basically real quick, what are the steps that you do to instill they're going to respect each other? And okay. Kind of um, if it's reinforce their hunting. Yeah. 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 Um, so if it's a dog, I would only bring a bird with a dog that dog's already been trained. Um, the dog is hundred percent already trained steady to shot. Like this is a good hunting dog already, not a young dog. Who's like, you know, I have no real control over, you know, okay. I'll wait. If the, if the dog is not ready for training, I'll wait until the dog is trained before I introduce it to a bird. And then, so once I introduce the bird, we do it real simple. You know, the bird gets to eat, the dog gets to eat next to the bird and the bird, the dog has to keep about, you know, about a two, three foot radius away from it. And you can establish that with the e-collar. So like I said, already trained dog, you know, when you hit that e-collar and gets to do it close and you say no, they go, okay, boom, got it. You know, and so it's like, there's this little perimeter around your bird. And once you start hunting with your bird, the dog gets it, the bird gets it. And it's a nice, beautiful thing. Okay. So, so yeah, nice. let them eat next to each other. And if it gets too close, a little nick of the e-collar to no, And, um, they're usually like, uh, okay, <laughs> we're done with that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, are there any types of breeds where you just would never put them in a situation to be a falconry dog? Like I know some certain dogs have, um, they're known for just being more tenacious or, um, for a falconry dog. Um, I, I can't think of a single breed that I would say, you know, shy away because falconry is so, you know, it's so, it's so different and it's so people want to do their falconry different from other falconers, you know, yeah. not everyone wants to goshawk in the English setter, you know, some people yeah. want to, you know, try to get a Brittany and, you know, chase cottontails, you know, it's cottontails with Brittany's you know, in the gun world, you know, use beagles. What are you, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and so, um, so I would say no, I don't want to say there's any breed because I wouldn't want to stifle anyone listening going, I, I want to try this, do it, try it. If everyone mm -hmm. says it's a bad act, just try it. As long as it doesn't hurt the dog, you know, if it's a new training method or using a new breed for something, you know, try it. That's how we get to where we're at, you know, with people just taking those risks and trying those weird things, kind of like the hair sock. That's how we got the hair sock. Now everyone flies hair socks. When yeah. they used to be like, oh, those are terrible birds. <laughs> Some people yeah. still yeah. argue that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. It's a, you know, it's That's fair. Point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe someone doesn't want to fly eight hair socks yeah. in one field. But. Yeah. I would say if your bird, if the dog is gamey, you know, if it likes chasing stuff, it's like chasing a ball or likes chasing feathers, then um, go for it. But you may find it, it'll be a little bit easier if you get the dog that was bred for that specific game you're hunting, you know don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, <laughs> you can right get some on. nice wheels out there. Um, what dog do you use for falconry? For falconry? Mm -hmm. I use two dogs. I use my lab, who doubles as a duck dog, and then I use an English setter for quail, grouse, and pheasant, and for that sort. Um, but he doubles as, you know, he'll he'll flush a pawn all day. You know, I can give him hand signals. These are, you know, the same duck hunting hand signals I give him. I can uh, cast him out into a pond and kick up the ducks. Um, but yeah, ducks, ducks and rabbits for the lab, and then... Um, Quail, grouse, and <laughs> pheasants for the setter. Okay, nice. I've been looking at the Munster landers. Oh yeah, smaller bike, small lurch. Yeah, um, small. So nice. And small. Um, is it true that they can point, retrieve, like pretty much do everything you're looking for in falconry? I would say yes, as long as you, you know, as long as you get with a breeder that they can prove it. You know, oh, okay. if the, the blood, you know, the blood pool is so small, there's not many monster lander breeders in the entire world. Like it's very small breed, um, which is a good and bad thing. Cause then you either have like a very small group of genetics, but they're all really good or they're all really bad. <laughs> you That's know? True. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> if you get out there and you're looking for a puppy, you know, make sure it's got all its OFA testing. That's the most important thing. Make sure it's elbows, eyes, and hips is all good. Um, basic. And then, um, if you can see the parents work, you know, make your decision from there. You know, if you can't see the parents work and they're just, you know, you see those, 
those are just, I don't know those fluff words of a great dog you know fun for the whole family loves to hunt you know that's not what yeah. you want you know you want proven this is the dog hunting this is a video this is a picture you know this is um, field trial champion you know all these type, types of things and okay. that's what you want that's what's worth spending your money on yeah because most of them are like across the country so you're yeah. asking the breeder send me a video yeah just and you, kind you of yeah get with people gather who gather some info yeah gather some info because uh those small breeds those small um, yeah those small breeds can be a little tricky when it comes to their gene pools yeah uh what's the next type of dog you think you might end up getting Ooh, the next type i was looking at salukis salukis yeah it's big salukis. sight hound big old nice long um sight hound to you uh jackrabbits if I, I was planning on making a move so that's oh, okay so if we make the move then I probably will get a Saluki just because oh, they're so cool. <laughs> Are they long hair dogs? Yeah, they're like long hair. Um, they're a larger breed and uh, they're the, they're the running dogs, like almost like oh, greyhounds, okay. if you will. Yeah. And um, yeah, they're good for jackrabbits. They keep jackrabbits up. People use them for yeah. uh, when they hunt eagles on jacks. Yeah, because they'll they'll keep those jacks going for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles, miles. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen the, the whippets do that. Yeah, too. whippets are cool too. Are Maybe a whippet. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I've never seen anyone with a Saluki, so that might yeah. be a good. Yeah, they're fun. <laughs> they seem fun. Yeah, that's definitely cool. So, um, what type of bird are you gonna fly next? What type of bird will I fly next? Yeah. I don't know. I might so, try an occipiter. I was yeah. thinking about an occipiter. Uh, I don't know. I'm just. I think I'll. Yeah, I think I'll do a sipiter. Um, I enjoy hunting quail and ducks with a gun, and that is kindly, you know, what I got into falconry for. When I realized red tails could not hunt ducks and quails, I was a little disappointed. <laughs> a little disappointed. I was like, I guess I'm not doing a California quail slam on um, a red tail. And so, uh, so yeah, I would like to just, you know, enter into different types of quarry. You know, so have some feathered game. So probably in a sipiter, cooper sock, maybe late passage cooper sock. Might strub one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now that you you did all the research and you're at where you're at, what do you feel like you get out of falconry when you're out there in the field? Um, it might sound a little weird because <laughs> most people are, are about it for the other ways, but um, it's emotionless. You know, I get out there with my bird and it's nothing. My bird's not asking me for anything. None of my focus is not looking at me. It's nothing. It's purely out there to hunt and it kind of just... I guess kind of just to take the back seat for once because, you know, when I'm training dogs a day in, day out, always, you know, 365 days a week, three times a day, um, you know, the emotions of a dog, they're, they're taxing on a human because a dog is asking you to be an emotional creature. So if you've had a rough day, you've had a long week, and you're training a new concept with a dog, you know, you have to be excited, you know. Being, you know, faking happy when you're not happy sucks. <laughs> and um, so you have to, you have to be this thing. You have to be this niche. You have to be a trainer, not an emotional human being. You have to be a trainer who's you know, sober minded and can do what needs to be done for the benefit of the dog. And um, with a raptor, it's just like, like, whatever, give me my slips. And I just go, oh, here's your slips. <laughs> and I guess to sit back and watch. Um, yeah, I guess it's emotionless. So it just gives me a, a chance just to recharge my batteries. Yeah. That makes sense. No, it does. It's a really honest, good answer. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, where is it? You said you mentioned you're going to move somewhere. Where? Hopefully Montana. Montana. Hopefully Montana or Arizona. Okay. It's like the Tennessee of rock and roll to dogs. Montana. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Oh, yeah, okay. there's a lot so. of big kennels out there, and um, yeah, I'm hoping to go out there and uh, start a little game farm, and uh, hopefully be on some nice property, and yeah, train dogs and. Just keep on doing what I'm doing, just a little bit bigger. Nice. That's a great goal. I never knew that about Montana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> Learn something um, new every day. <laughs> is there anything else that you would um, tell someone who's coming into falconry, um, basically with all of the barriers to entry, and then when you finally get in, um, just facing so many adverse, tough things with whether it's bird getting injured or your bird not cooperating with you like what is just some great advice that you could provide that you've lived through that kind of helped you get to where okay. you're at right now um don't beat yourself up too bad you know it's it's your first year you're an apprentice you don't know anything you never will know anything <laughs> you know just yeah. don't beat yourself up too bad you know your bird may get sick you may lose your bird your bird may die you may kill your bird you know <laughs> like you know there's a lot of things that could happen and i would say don't get discouraged because if anything's bad happened to your bird and you get discouraged and you quit, it was all in vain. 
You know, I believe if you take the time and you learn and you make your mistakes early off as an apprentice, you will do better for the entire species, you know, all birds of prey in your entire career than your, you know, your first learning curve at the get go, you know, in 10, 15 years, if you never gave up and now you're, you know, those are the guys who brought peregrines back to California. You know, if they were just some kids, you're like, I had a red tail and it died and I gave up, <laughs> you know, and they're just, you sure. know, I would just say, don't get caught up on it. Um, keep going, listen to your sponsor and, um, yeah, just don't, don't, don't beat yourself up too bad. It's okay to make mistakes. Just, you know, correct yeah. them. Don't make them again. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah, so that's so what if you guys, um, are interested in more about Vinny's dog training, uh, advent retrievers.com. Yep. And he's also, his Instagram is just advent retrievers. Yep. Do you have a falconry Instagram? Uh, no, it's just, no, it's just it's all uh, the same. Yeah, all the same. It's okay. all on the Advent Retrievers. Yeah. So reach Finney there, reach out to him. He's a really nice guy, and I'm sure he would be happy to help you with any questions you have along or even Absolutely. training. Absolutely. Dogs, yeah, but. reach out. I'd love to help you. Free charge. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's not. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ahead. talk to you for free. I'll talk to anyone yeah. for free. <laughs> Tips for free. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, great, man. I appreciate you cool. sharing your time, sharing your info with everyone. And, uh, you know, if you guys liked the content, um, give this video a like, subscribe so we can do more podcasts like this. We want to get more information from people that are generous enough to, you know, share their experiences. And Vinny's an awesome guy. I'm glad I got to meet you. All right, it's Thank good to you meet so you, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Right on.